Hey guys, good evening. It's uh, March 25th, 2020, about 9.30 uh, p.m. And uh, sorry I left you guys yesterday hanging, uh, but I'm back and still hanging on. Uh, thank goodness no symptoms at this point. Um, again, I finished my ICU stent uh, on Sunday. And um, uh, I promised I would talk a little bit about outpatient medications or preps that you can you can take that may prevent uh, viral uh, infections or at least boost the immune system. I want to disclaim that everything I'm saying tonight is is really just opinions uh, based off of several healthcare providers and MDs. Uh, one uh, one doctor from Korea uh, to get in touch with me, and he is from uh, Daegu City in Korea, which. Um, was, I, I believe, the hardest hit or one of the hardest hit cities with COVID-19. He reported that his smaller hospital had around 50 uh, uh, health care providers uh, to date have not contracted COVID-19. And um, he tried to translate for me uh, what exact cocktail they're using on their patients and uh, what their health care providers are taking. But uh, some of that was a little bit confusing in translation, but I'll, I'll do my best to convey uh, not only what he kind of said, but also what many other providers and, and uh, regular citizens that have ideas um, uh, in regards to prevention or prophylaxis. We're not talking about prescriptions tonight. Um, however, he did state that they are using uh, some of the same medications we are for treatment inside the hospital uh, for their more uh, moderate to severe cases. At any rate, I wanted to touch on vitamin C, clearly a, a big topic. And, you know, it's, it's when, you, when you just Google this or, or you look on, uh, online, you'll find uh, that doses somewhere between 1,000, maybe 2,000, up to three, um, would be adequate orally. However, when you, you speak to experts that have studied this, um, they're really using high-dose intravenous vitamin C for treatments in the hospital, way more than we're using here, uh, at least that I'm aware of in the U.S. Um, I'm sure there are clinicians that are uh, using these doses um, as well, but uh, uh, in, in ICUs right now, um, you know, we were limited to about a thousand milligrams every six hours, and they they were using up to 100 to 200 thousand milligrams or 100 to 200 grams. Um, uh, there is uh, some uh, older uh, U.S. data and papers on this as well uh, with oral vitamin C, and it looks like probably. Today, the liposomal form uh, seems to be better, a little bit better absorbed. Uh, but the biggest complication with taking oral vitamin C would be GI upset and diarrhea. Um, the uh, so-called gurus or experts on this um, will tell you that, you know, your body will basically uh, inform you when you've gone too high on the dose that when you're, when you're sick, uh, you need to utilize a lot more ascorbic acid or ascorbate and, and, and that you will develop diarrhea once you go over that sort of maximum dose. Um, but in fact, uh, uh, they're recommending just for normal intake, uh, somewhere in the realm of four to 12 grams of vitamin C, um, uh, or four to 15, uh, I'm sorry, grams of vitamin C just for normal intake. Uh, but that during viral pneumonias, you may need up to, again, one, 100 to 200 grams of vitamin C. And you don't just take that in pill form. They're using powders, uh, and, and mixing it, uh, somewhere between, uh, 10 and 15 grams per half a cup of water, uh, and then drinking that over four, six, eight, eight sessions per day. That not not uh, uh, repeating it, but rather splitting it up over that amount of doses. So the total dose just for normal are suggesting uh, could be as much as four to 12 grams. Um, however, uh, again, for viral pneumonias, you're, you're looking at over uh, over 100 grams. Um, so you'd have to exponentially, uh, you know, mix that about 10 to 15 grams per half a cup. And um, uh, so you're looking at five, six cups at least of water uh, if you're looking at those types of doses and then taking it again, uh, maybe a half a cup at a time uh, over uh, many, many uh, uh, frequencies throughout the day. So it could be you know, up to 15 or even 20 times a day that you would be doing that. Um, at any rate, uh, I'm not here to say uh, what is the absolute uh, for preventing COVID-19. I'm certainly uh, taking a vitamin, vitamin C supplement somewhere in the two to 3,000 uh, milligram uh, pill form on a daily basis, but I am ordering some, uh, some powder as well so I can mix uh, just in case I develop some symptoms. I'm not personally going to do it uh, just as a prophylaxis uh, at those types of doses. Um, uh, but again, uh, the uh, gurus and experts uh, going way back in the, in the literature suggest that, you know, your body will kind of inform you if you start to have diarrhea or GI upset, then you probably have gone too high. 
Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, I think, you know, one of the most important um, uh, vitamins that is being discussed right now. Of course, vitamin D complex. Uh, they're also using intramuscular injections of this in, uh, in Korea. Uh, and uh, they're using bigger doses than the standard pills that you would buy here. But uh, the general uh, recommendation is around 1,000 to 4,000 international units. But they're using uh, more than that in an intramuscular form for treatment. Uh, and I, I think also in a form of prophylaxis as well in their healthcare providers. Uh, but from my standpoint, I would probably keep it somewhere in the one to 4,000 interna international unit range for now until I have more evidence on that. Uh, zinc, uh, I think we may have said in previous uh, vlogs that uh, uh, 50 milligrams twice a day. However, after doing further reading and talking to other providers, it looks like that once you get over about 40 milligrams per day on zinc, uh, there could be issues with copper uh, metabolism and, and excretion, and you don't want to become copper toxic. Uh, um, I think, uh, at least for the clinicians here, they remember Wilson's disease, and we don't want those Kaiser Fleischer rings forming, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of joking, but in, in essence, I'm not. So I'm going to suggest for now to keep it 40 uh, milligrams or less until uh, we have any further evidence, but that, that seems to be about an appropriate dose. Selenium has been mentioned as well. I did have a doc uh, email me that he uses that in his regimen of prophylaxis and, and keeping that around 50 micrograms. That's micrograms, not milligrams. And then a good old vitamin B complex, and I'm trying to get more information on exactly how much of a B vitamin uh, we should be taking. Additionally, in Korea, they are eating healthy wraps, uh, lettuce wraps that they're using a soybean paste with garlic uh, and also green chili. And they also suggested that sea salt, especially heated a little bit, uh, is better than regular salt in the sense that they believe it inhibits that ACE2 receptor I've referenced in previous vlogs. Um, we know that the COVID virus and many viruses, or at least uh, the COVID does, enter the lungs uh, through that ACE2 receptor and that this may downregulate or inhibit that receptor. So if you have to use salt, uh, it sounds like sea salt is the way to go. Additionally, they're drinking tea, as we know, in, in, in uh, uh, Korea, and they suggested cut red ginseng uh, with licorice and tangerine peel. So if you're able to pull together those ingredients, uh, uh, they all, uh, there's also been suggestion that hot substances, and there's no proof to this yet, but that hot, hot substances may, in fact, uh, hurt the virus uh, and that there's suggestion it may stay in the uh, oral cavity or throat. Uh, for up to four days and that uh, even gargling with hot teas and, and drinking hot substances may, may hurt the virus and uh, the opposite that very cold things uh, may not uh, may help it survive but again there's no absolute proof on this they suggest that this tea again with cut red ginseng licorice um, and the tangerine peels may help with inflammation be an anti-inflammatory and decrease cough and pain associated or myalgias associated with um, with COVID. Um, I've also received uh, several other suggestions with mushrooms and, and different cocktails in regards to that. I guess, the um, you know, when is too much? I mean, we could just keep going and going and going. Um, one person did uh, ask me a question about low-dose naltrexone. That is a prescription. So I may cover that in a totally separate vlog, but um, thought, thought to have some immune boosting properties and increasing endorphin. Um, but I'm not going to get into the prescription tonight. I wanted to keep it pretty much... Uh, pure over the counter. So that's it for tonight's session. I uh, should be back tomorrow. Um, uh, please send me any questions that you have and stay well, stay healthy. Uh, let's keep fighting. I did want to make a comment that I've been watching a little bit of the TV, which I don't do too much, but I'm off this week. And, um, you know, they, they keep repeating in these ads and on, uh, on TV that, you know, this is a, a disease of uh, really the older and elderly and comorbid conditions. But I am hearing stories throughout the country of that 40 uh, to 43, 44 year old age group um, and uh, coming down with uh, the virus and, and going into acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, it's not just a few cases. There are many, many out there in this age group. I guess ultimately we'll get the uh, retrospective view on on how many of these patients are in fact in that age group. But um, I think it would be not safe to say that this is just uh, a risk for the older um, population that, in fact, we are seeing younger uh, uh, population and female, too, in their 30s. Uh, I know there's a few cases out there. So um, everybody, uh, you know, again, I've said it on a couple of vlogs, nobody's uh, completely immune to this and uh, stay protected. 
Um, uh, wash those hands, keep your social distancing or physical distancing, as it's been kind of coined uh, recently, uh, not to take away the, uh, the concept of us being able to still socialize. We certainly have the means. Uh, of a, other interesting note, Mount Sinai and some other institutions are looking at plasma-based therapy, and, and they're, they're looking for, I know, I think at Mount Sinai in New York City, they are looking for uh, um, subjects for their study where they want people that have already had COVID-19 proven, they've recovered from it, and now they'll have the antibodies. I did get a question uh, on that recently, and um, I did not uh, think that there is any commercially, I don't think there's any commercially available uh, IgG or IgM or antibody test yet that anybody can just go in and get, uh, although stay tuned. I'm sure they're working on that rapidly. Uh, but um, uh, I would contact or, or Google online in regards to that. I think it was Sinai that put that out, um, that they are uh, looking for as many patients as they can get right now um, to study them and their antibodies and possibly use those that plasma or that blood um, to give to patients who are severely ill. And I think they are doing that on a case-by-case -case basis, as I heard. So um, again, that's a little bit more advanced than I wanted to get to uh, for this talk, but hopefully we'll have more information on that. Again, stay well and get your rest. Um, oh, one last thing, melatonin. I forgot to mention that I mentioned in the other uh, vlogs. Uh, uh, I did read that about 0.3 is all is needed milligrams uh, as far as uh, what you need physiologically for uh, uh, hopefully uh, preventative effects. Although I, I did pick up a bottle of the five milligram uh, melatonin and I do plan on starting that myself personally tonight. Um, but remember if you have uh, comorbid conditions or even if you don't and you have any concerns about taking any of these over the counter preps, please check with your healthcare provider. Thank you and have a great night.